How often do you drink soda? Be honest. Once a week? Once a day? All the time? Whatever your answer, just stop it. Just stop drinking sodas. It's really bad for you. Or is it? No, no, don't, don't do that. Do what? That thing where you talk about a topic and you set up an expectation that you're gonna say one thing and then you turn around and you say something else just so that everybody's like, oh, that's an interesting way of looking at it. I never thought of it like that. He's such an interesting guy. Or is he? No, there is no other side to this argument. Hundreds of studies have linked sodas to obesity and weight gain, diabetes, even strokes. Or do they? Yes, they do. Not to even mention hormone spikes, tooth problems. The number one thing that anybody can do to improve their health is to cut out sodas. Or is it? This bit's run its course, hasn't it? Yeah. Or has it? In all seriousness, soda is kind of terrible for you. So if you are one of these all day, every day drinkers, I would encourage you to, you know, just, just throw a little water in there. Just saying. Ironically though, soda was originally considered to be a health drink, containing essential sugars for them and vega. Carbonated water was first introduced in the 18th century, and at the time they thought that it had healing properties that could cure a variety of ailments. So the first soda shops were actually in pharmacies, and they'd mix medicines into the drinks. For instance, you might order a lemon-lime lithium citrate or a caffeine and cocaine concoction. And nobody would have blinked, because at the time, cocaine was perfectly legal, and in fact, they felt it had beneficial properties. And it does, to a point. The cocaine alkaloid was first isolated from coca leaves in 1859 by Albert Nyman, and even though its commercial potential was debatable, doctors at the time embraced it. You could get cocaine drops for toothaches or cocaine throat lozenges. It was even used as an anesthetic by dentists and surgeons. Sigmund Freud, the famous psychoanalyst, used cocaine and promoted it as a cure for depression and sexual impotence. He also became super addicted to it, and it took him 12 years to break his habit. Cocaine could be found in all sorts of elixirs and tonics in the late 1800s and early 1900s, but there was one beverage that stood out above the rest. The authors Sir Arthur Conan Doyle and Jules Verne drank it, Pope Leo XIII carried it in a flask, even the US presidents Grant and McKinley were fans. It was said to give you energy, strength, vitality, and wings. Oh, that last one's something else, actually. What we're talking about here is Vin Mariani. What is Vin Mariani, you may be asking? Well, it's a combination of cocaine and wine. It's literally cocaine mixed with wine. Because who has time to drink wine and snort cocaine? That's just, that's just too much work. You like cocaine, you like wine, but doing both at the same time is hard. There's got to be a better way. Now there's Vin Mariani, wine with an extra kick of cocaine. Now you can have your Coke and drink it too. Perfect for weddings, retirement parties, funerals, bar mitzvahs, loitering, threatening people in clown costumes, breaking into your whore ex-wife's house to get your dog back, and much more. Vin Mariani, get lit today. It was invented in 1863 by a Parisian chemist named Angelo Mariani, and it's basically six milligrams of cocaine per fluid ounce of red Bordeaux wine. Damn, son. And they actually recommended drinking three glasses of this a day, basically drinking a glass with every meal. But before you guys start thinking these guys were completely crazy, just, just, just know um, they only recommended half that amount for children. Now, Timmy, be careful not to spill your wine and cocaine juice. Vin Mariani was so popular, it spawned a whole slew of copycat mixtures, including one by an Atlanta pharmacist named John Stith Pemberton. He was trying to find an alternative to the morphine and heroin-based concoctions that were out there, which were totally a thing and super popular at the time, but he found one that combined the extracts of the coca leaves and the cola nut. He called it Pemberton's French wine coca and claimed it was even better than Vin Mariani, even saying that, quote, it was a most wonderful invigorator of sexual organs, unquote. An effect that's shared by Vin Mariani and your mom. But Pemberton ran into a problem with his wannabe Spanish fly in 1886 when Atlanta passed a prohibition against alcohol, making his drink illegal. Not because of its cocaine, because of its alcohol. Because of this, he replaced the wine with sugar syrup and he renamed his concoction Coca-Cola, the temperance drink. His drink became so popular that it spurred a number of knockoffs, including Cafe Coca, Wyzeola, and my favorite, Celery Cola. Celery Cola. I can just imagine the taste of cola syrup mixed with nothingness. So how much cocaine was actually in Coca-Cola? Um, 
well, it's kind of impossible to say in the early days, but by 1902, it was down to like one four hundredth of a grain of cocaine per fluid ounce of cola syrup. So, I mean, you know, it's, it's not like, it's not like a lot of cocaine. But even that was becoming problematic because cocaine addiction was quickly becoming an issue in the United States at the time. This kind of mirrors our current day opium crisis because they put cocaine in everything, basically overprescribed it, and then lo and behold, people got hooked on it. By 1912, the U.S. recorded approximately 5,000 cocaine-related deaths. The drug became related with a loss of morality in the culture, and lawmakers started pushing for it to be outlawed which they did with the Harrison Narcotics Tax Act of 1914, which basically regulated and taxed any uh, extracts from coca leaves or opium plants and essentially put an end to cocaine being in Coca-Cola. But like a lot of things that happened in that time in American history, they made some room for a little bit of old-timey racism. African Americans and uh, laborers in general were associated with cocaine because uh, their employers would give them cocaine to make them more productive on the job. So, so this went way back. But when Coca-Cola was bottled in 1899, that was the first time that African Americans could really drink it because up to that point it was only sold in pharmacies and most of those were segregated. So of course, once it was available, they rushed out and, and bought it, which of course only played into that association that was already there between African Americans and cocaine. And this narrative began to form that there was this explosion of drug use among African Americans. To the point that in 1910, a U.S. State Department official, Dr. Hamilton Wright, said, quote, The use of cocaine by the Negroes of the South is one of the most elusive and troublesome questions which confront the enforcement of the law, unquote. So yeah, that's some, uh, that's some stay out the wool worse racism there. It's also kind of par for the course in those days. This right here was a Klan rally held in 1925 in Washington, D.C. 30,000 Klan members showed up and marched on Washington and nobody blinked an eye. Hell, 10 years later, the American Nazi party held a rally and filled Madison Square Garden. They were a little more racist back then. But due to the Harrison Narcotics Tax Act, as well as the Jones-Miller Act of 1922, uh, cocaine use kind of fell off to the wayside, kind of became an underground thing for a while, and then, uh, well, the 80s happened. The economy was rising, people wanted to party, and cocaine started flowing into the country from all over the world, and the price of cocaine dropped by as much as 80%. So the suppliers had to get creative and find new and cheaper ways of selling cocaine, and what they landed on was crack, which is basically cocaine mixed with baking soda and water. And it sold for as much as like $5 for a crack rock in 1985, and it became really popular in lower income communities. Popular is a weird word to use there, actually. It was a scourge. It uh, decimated poor urban neighborhoods. See this cute little vial here? It's crack, rock cocaine, the most addictive form. It isn't glamorous or cool or kid stuff. But the government's response to this uh, has been highly controversial ever since then and only compounded the problems in those neighborhoods. They passed a law called the Anti-Drug Abuse Act of 1986 and amongst a lot of other stuff that was in this bill, one of them was that it differentiated the sentences between cocaine and cocaine-based drugs. Lighter sentences for regular cocaine, heavier sentences for crack. In other words, if you got caught with a little baggie of cocaine, your sentence would be a lot lighter than somebody who was caught with a couple of rocks of crack, even though the amount of cocaine in crack is far lighter than that in regular cocaine because it's mixed with other stuff. And this flooded the prison system with low income and minority prisoners. So yeah, it's controversial. But there is some good news. The Fair Sentencing Act of 2010 was passed to sort of ameliorate these differences. And now if you get caught with crack, your sentence is only 18 times worse than regular cocaine. So, uh, progress. With methamphetamines and the opioid crisis getting all the headlines, you don't really hear as much about cocaine anymore, but it is still the second most popular drug in the United States, although that popularity is waning. According to the RAND population, spending on cocaine in the United States has dropped from $58 billion in 2006 to $24 billion in 2016. But maybe that's because we're drinking so much caffeine we don't really need it anymore. 80% of adults in the Western world consume caffeine in one form or another, from coffee to tea to the endless brands of energy drinks, also known as Kyle juice. And people are vaping so much nicotine, they're starting to die from it. Also, also known as Kyle juice. So maybe it just turns out that one way or another, people are just gonna want a little bit of a boost. People gonna people. But as they say, the dosage makes the poison. So does it make sense to decriminalize 
cocaine in small amounts? I mean, the number of people that died when cocaine was in Coca-Cola was far less than what happened in the 80s during the crack epidemic. Some countries like Colombia, Mexico, and Peru have decriminalized small amounts of cocaine and haven't seen any real substantial problems from it. In fact, Portugal decriminalized all drugs in 2001 and saw a huge decrease in drug overdoses, as well as HIV infections and drug-related crime. For something like that to happen in the U.S., though, it would take a massive shift in public opinion. A 2016 poll showed that 76% of Americans oppose decriminalizing cocaine. But who would have thought 20 years ago that marijuana would be legal in half the states in the United States? So, who knows? So I guess now if you want to try a Vin Mariani, maybe someday you'll get a chance to. Or an original Coca-Cola. But not new Coke. Never new Coke. All right, thanks you guys so much for watching. I've had a lot of people ask about, you know, whether or not Coke actually had Coke in it back in the day. And I just thought it was an interesting subject because uh, a lot of the stuff that today is just like verboten and you couldn't imagine actually being able to go out and get it. It just used to be in everything. It's just crazy. Real quick though, I want to give a shout out to some people that I really have not paid enough attention to and given enough love to on here, and that's the members of this channel. So uh, YouTube does have memberships now. If you look below the video, there's a little button that says join. If you ever wonder what that means, that's what it is. Uh, right now it's about $5 a month. You can join and you can get free uh, early access to videos. You get access to exclusive live streams that are only for Patreon and, and members. And uh, there's about 100 people right now that are on there. And I, I have not thanked you guys enough. I really do appreciate it. And if you are interested, just click that join button down below. Right now, it's only $5. Uh, that's the only tier that's available. There are uh, going to be more coming soon. That's going to look a lot more like Patreon. But anyway, if you're interested in supporting the channel but don't like the idea of Patreon or anything like that, this might be a good option for you. Just uh, click down below and see what it does. Like always, please do like and share this video if you liked it. And if this is your first time here, check out this video. Google thinks you'll like that or any of the others down the side. And if you like the cut of my jib, you like the kind of stuff I cover, uh, please do subscribe. I come back with videos every Monday and every Thursday. And that'll be it for now. You guys go out there, have an eye-opening rest of the week, and I'll see you on Monday. Love you guys. Take care.